alhamdulillah, as we uh, enter into a new year, at least on the uh, Gregorian calendar, we are inshallah starting a new class. Um, so welcome to everybody. Uh, I see some new faces here, alhamdulillah. And it's good to see everybody. We're going to be focusing this class. It's going to be about our the journey of the human soul from pre what we would call the the first stage of our life all the way until the afterlife. And so we're going to be covering a text um, known as the Lives of Man by Imam Abdullah bin Ali al Haddad. We'll do our best to summarize the text. We're not going to go through line by line. The intention, inshallah, is going to be to complete the class uh, right before Ramadan. So that'll be about nine or ten sessions, inshallah. Um, and then we'll complete this topic right before the month of Ramadan. So to start off with context um, and why this topic is really critical in the time that we live in. In order for us to know why we're here and where we're going, it's first important for us to know where we came from. And Allah has defined that very, very clearly in his noble book in the Quran al And his Prophet وسلم, has explained that to the human being. This gives the human being some focus and some purpose in life and it allows that purpose that informs our daily actions and informs what we do on a day-to-day -day basis to move towards that purpose. Absent any context of where we came from and understanding of where we're going, the human being loses their sense of purpose. And then we just become wandering people. Uh, and this is exactly the time that we're living in, where the vast majority of Western society has forgotten about their purpose in life. Most people don't believe in the afterlife anymore. There's no understanding of accountability for the actions that we have. There's no understanding of reckoning for what we do in this life. And so then what ends up happening is everybody just does whatever they want. And it becomes a life of fun, games, play, and a lot of injustice and corruption, as we're seeing now, and we've been talking about it, and we'll continue to talk about it, inshallah. All of us should keep our brothers and sisters in, in Gaza and the West Bank and Palestine in general in our intention um, as we are uh, having the, the, the blessing and really the luxury of being able to gather together in safety and in, in peace. And so when we lose that purpose, this wandering starts. And that's why in the West you have statements like, do whatever you want because you only live once. When in our understanding that that's not at all the case, you don't only live once, you actually live many multiple times and this life is a very short life as we'll be discussing. The life of the dunya is in the grand scheme of things a very small, small, small percentage of dot in the ultimate life that Allah has planned for the human being. Because the human being is actually created for eternal existence not for a limited existence in this life. Meaning, meaning that we will at some point with Allah's, um, uh, that if Allah gives us this ability, have the chance to go into one of two places eternally. And inshallah is the Jannah and not the Hellfire. But that is the choice that the human being has based on the consequences of what they do in this life. But if we think that this is the only life I have, uh, so I should have all the quote-unquote fun that I want. I should bask and just enjoy all my desires, and then I can do whatever I want and there's not going to be any accountability. Then you get the situation that you have in Western society right now, where the concept of the afterlife has disappeared. The small um, amounts of, that are left with, let's say, Christian society and kind of some of the Christian thought that still exists, there's a carte blanche to do whatever you want because the, the belief is that Jesus died for your sins, and so you don't have to have any accountability for your sins. So you're basically left, again, at the will of your own desires. This never used to be the way of the Muslim, ever. The Muslims had a defined purpose, and they internalized this purpose by understanding where they came from, by understanding where they came from. So what we're going to do is we're going to cover um, five stages that he covers in this text, uh, and we'll have one or two classes on each of the stages, inshallah. The first is the life before we were born. There was an entire life that was lived before the human being was born. This is the day, and we'll, that's what we'll focus on for today's topic, the time in which Allah asked every human being, rabbikum, am I not your Lord? And every human being said, Qalu bala. This is from the Quran in Surah Al-Araf. So it's mentioned very specifically that every human being gave this covenant to Allah and promised him and told him, yes, you are our, our Lord. And they acknowledged it. This acknowledgement happened. 
This life was before we even came into existence. And just like we don't remember the life in the womb, we don't remember it. But that was, that was a period of time before we were uh, born. There was a life in the womb. And so you, you don't have to remember everything for it to have happened. For it to have happened. Um, the second is the life that we're in right now, which is the dunya. This is the small slice of reality, he says, that we are most familiar with. Just a small amount of reality. Because we live it day to day and we see it. The person who thinks this life is it, that this dunya is the only thing, they are ultimately going to lose out in, in, eternal, in the eternal race for, um, uh, for divine forgiveness and in the eternal race for divine pleasure. They will ultimately lose out. This dunya, he divides, and we'll cover these, inshallah, in sections, into five different parts. So you have childhood, um, you have the age of youth, where discernment starts to happen, you have the age of maturity, third stage, you have the age of seniority, and you have the age of essentially decrepitude, when someone is on their way out um, and by, their, by their age. And he's going to talk through what the requirements are for the human being in each stage, meaning what the child gets to do is not the same as what the adult is responsible for. So if the child just wants to play, like my son is here right now, he's about a, month, a year and a half old, alhamdulillah, and all he wants to do is play. You know, at some point he'll be running around, he'll make noise, Please uh, pardon uh, the, any of the disruptions, but that's what the child does. They just want to play, they just want to hang out, they just want to eat. There's no sense of, and nor does there need to be, because this is what Allah created, and this is what they're supposed to do at this age, that there's no sense of responsibility at that time. But as the human being gets older, as he'll talk through, and especially as they get toward more advanced ages, responsibility kicks in. And now someone's life can't just be about play and about fun and about in consuming and so on and so forth. It has to start to be a level of, 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 of responsibility towards the rights that Allah has and towards the rights that um, their fellow creation has. So this is the second um, uh, part of, of human life, is the dunya is divided into these five stages. The third begins at the moment someone dies. So now we only got to two lives and there's three other lives that are left after you die after we die from this lit world. So the third begins after the moment someone passes away. And this is now where someone, the, the next dimension of things starts to open up for the human being. This is known as, the, they enter into what's called the barzakh, the intermediary realm. This is a dimension that exists while we are existing right now, but the vast majority of people don't have access to it. It's not, see, you can't see it. Um, and uh, just like there are certain um, parts of uh, that, that you have to look under a microscope for you to see, you know, molecules, and then you have to look under a subatomic microscope for you to see certain things with that you can't see with your naked eye. There are other, there are other creations of Allah. There are other forces at play in the unseen realm that you and I can't see, and they they are not accessible to the vast majority of people. Sometimes when you're in the dream, when you're in a dream, you access things from this unseen, from these unseen realms that you may not be able to access in the seen realms, especially um, uh, that the, 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 the uh, human beings who are working towards themselves and who are working on themselves spiritually, perhaps they'll see a little portion of this. The prophets, they have access to the unseen as Allah wishes for them to, while they're still in this world physically. And then anyone who has a portion of their inheritance, they'll have an access to this. But the core here is the third life is the barzakh, the intermediary realm. This is from the time you die to the life in the grave. The grave is not just this six foot by six foot box that someone lives in. It can actually be a lot smaller for some people if the punishment is there from Allah and then a lot of terrible things happen to that person in the grave. And then it can be very, very, very vast for others, like a full jannah. A, 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 a door is open to paradise for them in their grave and they don't really have it says though they see as far as the eye can see that's how wide their grave would be for them it's all happening though in the unseen because if you go to their cover if you go to their grave and visit them in the cemetery you won't be able to see that you and i will not be able to see that but that's what they're experiencing so this is again this intermediary realm um, so we'll talk about we'll talk here about what happens when someone dies in accordance with our faith and our understanding. Um, and then what can we do while we're still alive to prepare for that? And then what can we do to benefit those who have already passed away? Uh, so, you know, there's certain forms of charity one can give and put on, one can recite and others, and we'll, we'll talk about that. The fourth will be the life on the day of judgment. 
The day of judgment is, is, is an, it's an entire life in and of itself. When human beings are resurrected, and while the judgment is taking place, there's a life that they live. Allah says in the Quran, it is. How, does anyone know how long Allah says in the Quran that the day of judgment is? 50,000 years. 50,000 years. So if we live till 75, right, in this life, 50,000 years is. How many times is that? Let me figure that. Someone, someone who's calculator brain, let us know how how quick, how, how many uh, times you'd have to live this life to reach fifty thousand years without using your iPhone calculator. Uh, just kidding. No, go ahead. Tell us though. So, so that's but that's fifty thousand. That's the day of judgment. For some, it will be shortened. For others, it will be lengthened. This is based on uh, uh, what Allah wants to do with them and based on their taqwa. So the Prophet ﷺ tells us that for some it will be like two light raka, like somebody prays Salat al-Isha, they pray two quick sunnah after, their day of judgment could go by for them like that. But it is an entire life because there's a whole, there's phases. There's the time where someone is gathered on the concourse. There's the time where the trumpet, the trumpet will blast first. And there's all, then there's the time people are gathered on the concourse and they are, are awakened. Then there's the time where um, uh, that somebody is has to face the questioning from Allah. Then there's the scales that someone has to face the balancing on the scales. Then there is the intercession of the Prophet ﷺ. And there's many other events that will take place on the Day of Judgment. And so one, we would we'll talk about what those events are. And then lastly, the fifth life. This is the eternal life. Either Jahannam or Jannah. Either Hellfire or Heaven. This is where somebody is going to be placed. Um, and so these are the five lives that the human being that he breaks apart Imam al-Haddad in this text He breaks apart these five lives um, Some could might you know break them out into a few more um, But that's at minimum the amount that somebody lives So why is it so critical as we were just talking about to discuss these lives that the human being has because if somebody can really tap into the knowledge of what they used to be and where they're going in the day-to-day we will have the direction of what we're marching towards. This is the best thing that we can offer to Western society specifically, but really to the vast majority of humanity because people are lost right now. Everybody's looking for something. Everybody's searching for something. And when most people are lost, they're empty. Their heart is empty. And then we fill it with all sorts of random things. Somebody will try to fill it with drugs. Another person will try to fill it with alcohol. Someone will fill it with both. Someone will fill it with their sexual desires. Someone will fill it with just all consuming media all the time. Someone so filling it, filling it, filling it. But it can't be filled by these things. It will continue to remain empty, and 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 uh, those things will will not actually help give the purpose that the human being has. The only purpose that can fill the heart of the human being, this empty cup, you could say that someone has, is their faith and is there is Allah at the end of the day is a real deep deep faith and understanding what is the direction that we're supposed to be going and that's the only thing so when somebody talks about happiness and fulfillment true happiness is divine eternal happiness when somebody attains this state it's not temporary happiness it's not like this makes me happy right now you'll see in the society we live in similar to this concept of you only live once but we just talked about how many times do we live? Five times. So none of us should ever say YOLO or any of these phrases because they're not, they're just not true, they're false, right? But but they're, they're a way to get the human being just caught up in desires. But just like that is a is a is a is a concept, um, and, and somebody might have a very, very short-sighted focus to this life. There are people who when they understand how valuable the time is here. Does anybody here work in finance or ever done like any investments before? All right, I have one, few, okay, two or three handful of people. So you'll anyone who's ever invested any money, you'll know, okay, if I invest the right amount of money in the right investment, right? You can't, you don't just invest in whatever. You have to make sure you invest in something that actually makes sense for you to, to put your money behind. I will have a strong ROI or a strong return on my investment, and I'll get what are called dividends later on. This life is the life to make the investment in the Akhirah. Every minute or day that someone uses wisely in this life pays significant dividends and a major ROI in their next life. And every day that somebody wastes, they are in significant loss in the next life. And the, the key is here, 
unlike in our dunya and in our money, we know okay, how much we have, and okay, you'll know, like, if I have $20,000 to, to in, in my bank account, let's say, somebody has $20,000 in their bank account, they'll know when that is gonna run out. The problem is you don't know when your bank account of days is gonna run out. We don't know. It could be tomorrow, it could be tonight, it could be in a year, it could be in 35 years, it could be in 70 years, we don't know. Like, SubhanAllah, just today, may Allah have mercy on him, my brother, uh, Imam in a masjid in New Jersey was, was shot at Fajr, at Fajr time while entering or leaving the masjid. Just, and, 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 and he, I, I don't know if he would have, right, if someone would have expected that, that while they're going to pray, and that's something that's going to happen. But inshallah, what a noble action that they were going to do while that took place. So you don't know though the life that you have to live. Nobody knows the amount of days that they have in their life. This is why when the days are numbered, the days have to be meaningful. And which is why we have to now get away, and hopefully this, this will be a reminder in this text, of the distractibility of the society that we live in, where, we, where our days are not meaningful for the most part. The vast majority of people in the society we live in, the days are very just, we use phrases like, I gotta kill the time, I gotta pass the time. The believer doesn't kill time. The believer uses time to leverage, leverage his time to do what they need to do to accomplish in life. But they don't just want to pass the time, Netflix show after Netflix show, this thing after this thing, this game after this game, and it just keeps passing and passing. That's not the point. But this just the, the, when the purpose is gone, the empty, vacuous distractibility starts to enter. And so this, when someone knows their purpose, you just won't, you'll, you'll know it. You'll know, the feeling will hit inside that I have to use my time wisely and someone has a set amount of time for leisure and everything else is with purpose, whether it's with family or taking care of their relatives or working or so on and so forth, but the intention and the, the, the purpose is there with that. But that has to be the case if we know where we're going. This is why the Messenger of Allah, he told us to remember death multiple times a day. And this is the, the third life, um, uh, the third life is that we'll, that we'll discuss is about this um, uh, remembering death and, and understanding what does death actually mean. But that, that, that takes a, um, a really thinking, not just intellectually, but spiritually. So for, we could go to a janazah prayer, funeral prayer. It may have no impact on us. That means that the heart is, has, is dying, spiritually is dying, because we're not thinking, hold on a second, I'm going to be laying down here one day and they're going to be praying janaza on me. And so when am I, how am I going to do in that time? And when that's the case, all of the things that we care about, what you want to worry about is what you're going to look like on that day, not what we look like and how we act and so on and so forth in this life. Meaning, spiritually, the, how luminous your heart is inside will be, how luminous your face will be, and how luminous someone's existence in the um, barzakh will be. That, that is the, the case. And how dark someone is in this life, dark, how dark their heart is, how rotten it is, will be then how the type of death they might have, as well as the, um, uh, the way that they'll experience the barzakh and intermediary realm. So we ask Allah for always for husn al khatima, a good seal and a good ending, to use the second life that we've been given wisely. So with that, we'll get to the um, the first, the first life, as he describes, which is from creation, the time Allah created us until we were conceived, until we were in the wombs of our mothers. There's an entire life that we lived. So the first is, Allah, Allah mentions this in the Quran, Allah created Adam alayhi salam. He created Adam alayhi salam. And he created human beings from our father and our mother, uh, Sayyidina Adam alayhi salam and Sayyidina Hawa uh, alayhi salam. And so, so these are the parents of the human beings, but we are Bani Adam. Now, there was a moment at which all of the souls, so everybody here, everybody in our families, every, all of our friends, everybody we know and everybody we don't know, anyone who was ever created, Allah took them out and he asked them to take a covenant. He brought all of the souls out and he asked them to take a covenant. And this is known as the Day of the Covenant, in which, um, and, and, and it's mentioned in a narration, this happened in a valley near Arafat. Arafat is in, in Mecca, far outside of, in the Mecca area, um, where one goes for Hajj. So this actually happened in a physical place. And 
Allah says in the Quran, when your Lord brought forth from the children of Adam, from their loins, their seed, and made them testify of themselves, Allah subhanahu am I not your Lord? Falu bala shahidna. Yes. Everybody said yes. We bear witness and we testify. And then Allah says that is that that so you should not say on the day of judgment. Oh, we, we didn't we were completely unaware of this because it's deep entrenched inside the soul of the human being. So on one hand, the spiritual path is one of remembering and uncovering and unwrapping what's inside of you already. It already exists deep down inside. But the more, this is why the heart is so important, the more the heart gets covered and covered and covered and layered and layered and veiled and veiled, the harder it will, the harder it will be to remember this pivotal purpose that already is lodged inside of the human being. The more the heart gets peeled, all these darknesses go away and all of the, the sins that we do that bring about the darknesses go away, the easier it will be now to remember this, this internal longing. And this is why some people, they have a deep longing for Allah. Deep longing for Allah. They wish to be with Allah. They wish to spend time with Allah. They wish to, they wish to connect to Allah. They wish to be at Allah's house. They wish to frequent the houses of Allah, the masajid of the houses of Allah. They wish to frequent the Kaaba, and so on and so forth. Because that longing exists. Why does it exist? And why does the human being who's far from Allah have so much depression, anxiety, stress, tension? Because the only thing, putting that, that at a spiritual level, of course, there's other reasons for this, the only thing spiritually that can cure the human ailment is their connection to Allah. And all of it then is either you're longing for the one who created you and who wants you to be near to him, or you're far from him and kind of running far in the own direction. Allah is trying to call you back regularly. Allah is all giving us many chances, calling us back, calling us back, calling us back. And we're not, maybe we're not listening, we're being rebellious. But Allah is patient with us and he continues to give us time. Because this longing was already deposited inside of your, in the depths of the human being. It was already there. At this moment, in this very real event that took place, Allah to be Rabbi home. Am I not your Lord? That was, that was the, the key. Um, and so why do we say, we say thicker? What does, what does the word thicker mean? Remembrance, right? Remembrance. So you only have to remember if you forgot, right? And so heedless, there's either you're for, we've forgotten or we're remembering. And the more we remember, what we're remembering Allah, and as we remember Allah, we are remembering this key, this key uh, uh, deposit that's been put inside of us of our purpose in life. Am I not your Lord? This is not a verbal statement only. This is a deep spiritual statement. Think about it. Am I not your Lord means that am I not the one who's in, you should have your entire focus on your life for, that's Allah. Am I not the one who you should put above everything else? That's Allah. Am I not the one who should supersede all of your desires, the desire for money and fame and power and sexual appetite and so on and so forth? That's Allah. And as you continue going on the Lordship, anything you give priority to above Allah becomes an idol for the human being. So at the time we live in, very few people have physical idols that they worship. People used to worship physical idols and, and, and so on, like the little, you know, they would make idols and they would bow down to them. Now, the, most, most people, we have figurative idols which have been, which we've created. So some of us worship ourselves, some of us were narcissists, we worship the idea of, of how great we are and so on and so forth. That's, a, that's an idol in the human being. Others worship their looks, gotta look this way, gotta make sure everything's perfect. Other, some, we were talking about this in the last, last couple of classes, like the, all the fake filters and everything out of social media. If it doesn't even, if it's not even how one really looks, why would one use those filters and, and amplify themselves? Because they want, they, the looks have now taken a status in the heart of the human being. Others worship money. It's all about money, constantly trying to earn more and more and more. To the point, to a, to a limit, it's good. And then after that, it's excess, right? Others worship fame and status, luxury. Right? I gotta have this luxury bag and this luxury car and this luxury watch so everybody can see who I am and everyone can see. Meanwhile, you know, hundreds of thousands of people are starving around the world and are suffering, and we we care only about our status and so on. This is again; these are idols that are created in the heart of the human. Allah wants you to say, when you say Allahu Akbar, all of the idols should be destroyed inside of the heart. And Allah to be become Am I not your Lord? Is Allah not our Lord? That should come back. That chief meaning should come back. So this is the. Uh, 
wisdom behind trying to recall this event. So now that you and I know we've said this, Allah says in the Quran, you can't, you're not going to be able to say that it didn't happen. Because it did happen and everybody saw it happen. And of course Allah bore witness to it as well. So now it's going to be a, I could say I forgot, I could say that I didn't listen, but nobody is going to be able to say that, no Allah, you did not create me. That's not going to be possible. So then this journey is one, and this life is a journey of what? A journey for your soul, for our souls, to find God. That's the purpose of life. It's, it's, uh, and we only created mankind and jinn to worship me, or لِيَعْرِفُونَ to know me, to get to know me. Because experiential knowledge of Allah happens as you go through the movements of life. It doesn't just happen in one day. One will see, okay, this happens in my life, now I experience Allah in this way. And then this happens and now I learn about how Allah is generous with me. And then this happens and now I learn about how Allah wants me to be patient and so on. And one gains this, they have this relationship, this interaction with their Lord. This is the key focus for <coughs> in the life that we live in, is to have these daily interactions and these, um, these daily engagements. So all of the children of, of, of Adam uh, السلام, took place in this, uh, took, took part in this. Um, and there are some people who they can remember enough to remember this moment. We've heard this from some of the scholars, but, but that's not something that awam, the vast majority of us, would be able to, to, to happen, right? But some people, their thicker can get so strong that they can remember this moment that actually took place. So spiritual, the dimensions of spirituality, the dimensions of the unseen, and the dimensions of the multiple lives that exist, the multiple dimensions that exist, can become unveiled to somebody if Allah wishes, and usually through a significant amount of, of spiritual effort that one puts in. Um, so this is possible, the closer and closer one gets to this station of gnosis, of ma'nifa of Allah, the more they might have these types of experiences. But that's not the, the goal is not necessarily only to remember this. The goal is to remember Allah and you'll feel it. One will feel the unlocking of, you know what, I know now what my purpose is. And when one doesn't know, it's just cloudiness that has to be washed away and we'll talk about how one washes that away. So differing degrees of people, as we mentioned, had different degrees of awareness during this event. So the Prophet, والسلام, he was fully aware when these things were taking place. He was aware in many, many, many moments. He mentioned in one narration, that his light was the first to be created, and in another narration, that he was a prophet already when Adam السلام, was between clay and water. So there are narrations, is one of the strong opinions of the Ahl Sunnah Jama'at, where the first to be created was the light of the Nabi, وسلم, and then from that everything was created. Um, but uh, so he was already aware. And then he mentions in a narration that he was there when Nuh, السلام, when Adam السلام, came down from the, to the earth, he was present. In Nuh السلام, when he boarded the ark, when he boarded the, 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 um, uh, the, the famous Noah's ark, he was there with Abraham السلام, uh, when he was thrown into the big fire, into Nimrod's fire, and so on and so forth. So there's many events which the Prophet السلام, was present in, and he took place in those events. But this happened in a spiritual way that you and I will not be able to, to, to understand because it's a spiritual reality that the prophets are gifted. But his status as the chief prophet, as the Sayyid of all the prophets, as the Imam of the prophets, Imam al Mursaleen, gives him such a high status that Allah allowed him to be present. And so he also then, there was an awareness in this, um, in this stage. But the, the key point though for us is to know that this was real and that we will be asked about it. We're not gonna be asked about all the details of everything that's happened in our life but we have to know that we will be asked about this. And an example would be, does anyone here remember their birth into this world? Nobody remembers it? Hmm. But did it happen? It happened. Some people might, they, they definitely know what happened, right? And some, some might have, you know, some photos or videos of it, others might have a uh, you know, memento from the hospital or wherever they were born. It happened. So you don't have to remember something to happen for it to have actually happened. This is where the argument of the Catholic, of the atheist, falls apart. 
because they rely on their limited, our, our limited, human limited intellect and limited memory to say, well, if I don't do this, this, and this according to my intellect, it could not happen. Well, hold on a second. The intellect is created. The intellect is created and it's pretty limited. The intellect is actually very limited until it's unlocked with the light of spirituality. The intellect is very limited. It won't be able to understand many things. So just because we don't remember it doesn't mean it, doesn't, it didn't take place. Also, do any of us remember life in the womb? Do you remember? Do you remember life in the womb? He's the strongest chance is for him to remember. And I don't know if he thinks. I don't think even he does. Right? Even though it was like two years ago. So uh, if you don't remember life in the womb, but did it happen? Yeah, it happened. Hundred percent happened for everybody. So again, there is a life that exists, and that doesn't have to coincide with the understanding of the human being. So then, what we have to do is we have to trust God when he tells us this happened. Just like our children, if we tell them, yeah, you were born, and there was a time when you were, you were in the womb, and then there was a time when you were born, they are gonna have to believe us. It would be very foolish to say, no, you're making all of that up. None of it happened. Prove it. Prove to me that mom exists. As they say, the, the children, the twins are arguing in the womb. Like, I heard about mom. Mom? What do you mean mom? Mom? Who's mom? Like, mom? Mom is the one who, who, who we're inside right now. It's like, I don't believe in mom. And that's like the atheist versus the, the believer. I, but mom is there. It's a real thing. And so the concept of God, when God tells us all these things, the human being is supposed to say, okay, I'm going to first start with believing you, and then I'm going to work on my own journey to uncover what that means. Why? Because everybody would believe at a deep level in, if we all maintained our fitra. What is fitra? Fitra is your primordial innocence, your primordial reality that you were born with. Every human being is born with a deep innocence. As we go through life, we get corrupted. Our, our sins, they start to veil us. We look at things that are inappropriate. We hear things that are inappropriate. We interact in, in a way that, that, that accumulates sins. The heart becomes dark and dark and dark and dark and dark until something happens. When the heart becomes so dark that the fitra is gone, now that heart begins to become rebellious and question things. That in an early stage, if you, if you tell a child about Allah, the child will believe you 100%. There is no way the child has any reason to doubt it because their fitra is still intact. Their, their primordial innocence and reality is still intact. They know, okay, yeah, this makes a lot of sense. And so they'll just believe it. But the questioning starts to come when the darkness starts to appear in the heart. So the reason why it's important for us to trust when God says something is because we're not in our primordial innocent states anymore. We're just trying to get there. But the path to get there, Allah has laid out in the Quran and the Prophet ﷺ has told us. The trust we have to put in then is that what they've said is correct so that it can help me wake up and get there. Otherwise, we'll just be in this constant loss and this constant limbo stage. This constant limbo stage. So. Um, uh, the key to unlocking this remembrance, the key to unlocking this stage is fill your heart with light, with nur. Very simple equation. We'll, we'll mention this and then we'll, we'll mention one um, very nice narration in this chapter and then really this chapter is done. It's a very short section in this first one. Um, Dhikr, remembrance of Allah, obedience to Allah, serving Allah, serving Allah's creation, doing things that are of goodness to Allah's creation increases your light, increases your nur. The more nur that comes in, the more purified the heart becomes. Sins, looking at things in an inappropriate, watching things in an inappropriate, dressing in an inappropriate way, uh, saying words that are inappropriate, so on and so forth, these bring darkness to the heart. Whether you realize it or not, it doesn't happen in one day. It's gradual, 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 consuming things that are inappropriate, uh, haram food, haram dr drugs, around drinks, so on, they, they contaminate the heart, contaminate the heart, contaminate the heart, until that heart becomes sealed like a rock, and then nothing can get through to it. Nothing can get through to it. Like the hearts of all these politicians, Biden, Lincoln, Netanyahu, all of these shayateen, they're just devils. Why? Because their heart has become so sealed, nothing can change their heart. Nothing. I mean, it's obviously miraculously possible for God to change their heart. But in, a, in the realm of means, 
when you've done so much injustice, so much killing, so much killing of children, so much starvation of innocent children, women, men, and continual injustice, you're the leader of the, of the unjust nations in the modern era, what's going to happen? All of those sins now fall upon your heart. That heart will get darkened. So you and I won't, we don't understand, like, hold on a second, why don't these guys just get it? Because there's no capacity left to get it. The heart has become sealed. Allah says it is their, that, that their, their, their hearts become deaf, dumb, and blind. And their hearts get locks on them, and they become hardened like rocks. It's very difficult to, to talk to a rock, to convince somebody who just, there's no opening that's possible. So you and I have to protect ourselves while we're in this stage where we still have, inshallah, the, just the ability to choose between good deeds and sin before the sins accumulate so much that they darken the heart. Once somebody starts on the path of good, they'll want to do more and more good. It'll just be natural. But that it takes a certain force of, of, of uh, a push that one has to have. We have to really, really push yourself to get there, to resist the initial sins of the, of the nafs. The nafs is the, the animal soul, the nafs of amara. It's, it inclines towards sins, it inclines towards darkness, it inclines towards desires, it inclines towards just laziness and sleeping in all the time and all these sorts of things, which make the human being into a state of a lethargy and into a state of not doing anything. And then when, when they don't do anything, they're likely to do more sin. This is why the human being is supposed to be moving. We're 70 plus percent water, and water remains fresh while it's moving, like in a stream. It remains fresh while it's moving, both spiritually and physically. That's why it's very, very important for the human being. Um, so all of these things will help the human being remember this moment. So there's a well, there, there's an amazing hadith of um, which is narrated about Musa alayhi salam and his understanding of this ummah. So we'll, we'll we'll talk through most of it, and then um, and then we'll end inshallah. So it's narrated that uh, on the authority of Wahab ibn Munabbih that when Musa salam, read the tablets, the tablets, he found in them the merits of the nation of Muhammad sallallahu Who is the nation of Muhammad? We, alhamdulillah, are the nation of the Prophet sallallahu This is the ummah of the Prophet sallallahu And in it, and then he lists many, many, many blessings. So he asked these questions. So did Musa salam, what was his trait that he had? Does anyone, well, what was the title that he was given and the trait that he had? Kalim Allah, he could speak with Allah directly. Musa alayhi salam directly conversed with his Lord. And there was, um, so he asked Allah, he says, Oh Lord, what is this mercy given nation that I see in the tablets? Allah says, It is the nation of Ahmad. So the Prophet, وسلم, his name is Muhammad in this life, but in eternal, in a, in a after life, his name is Ahmad. He has many, many, many names, over a hundred different names um, for the Prophet uh, It is the nation of Ahmad, whose people are content with whatever little provision I give them, and I am content with whatever amount of ibadah and works they are able to do. And I make each one of them enter the garden by their testimony, La ilaha illallah. La ilaha illallah is, that's it. The goal is La ilaha illallah, the beginning is La ilaha illallah, the end is La ilaha illallah. When one will realize what we mean by that, through experience. It's not something, it's an intellectual concept. You will realize what la ilaha illallah means. Everything is about Allah. That's the goal. And so there is no Lord who is worthy of worship except Allah, who is worthy of attention except Allah, who is worthy of our focus except Allah. There is no reality that's worthy of that except Allah. But this is something that the human being needs to realize. So they enter the garden. What does shaitan want to do? He wants to take la ilaha illallah away from so at the upper limit of what the devil will try to get to, to someone to do is to disbelieve in la ilaha illallah because he knows that even if the human being is sinning left and right, we're all making mistakes. We're talking now somebody is doing kabair sins, all sorts of sins, left and right, left and right. As long as you have la ilaha illallah, the garden, ultimately you will get to the garden, inshallah. Ultimately everybody we will get to the jannah because the Prophet sallam, tells us that he will intercede for this nation and his station on the Day of Judgment is the highest station and he will be given an intercession. What's intercession? It means somebody who's going to beseech Allah on your behalf because we will have nothing to stand before Allah with. And so he's going to go to Allah and say, Ya Allah, save my ummah, save my ummah. And he reserved du'as 
that Allah said are going to be accepted du'as, He reserved them for the day of judgment for you and for me. He said, I'm reserving these du'as for my ummah on the day of judgment when I know we're going to need them. And Allah has guaranteed the acceptance of those du'as. And Allah says in the Quran, we will give you until you're happy. And the Prophet is not going to be happy until every member of this ummah enters Jannah. Until every member. And in some, he's going to go and pull them out of the fire himself. That's how much the Prophet loves you. But shaitan will want you to leave him, leave Allah and leave his messenger. Shaitan's goal. So never let, when those whispers of shaitan come, know that they are whispers and you have to do whatever you can to resist them. Even if one is not practicing much at all, that should not, we can't allow that to become into our hearts. If shaitan can't get someone to do that, then he'll get someone to sin a lot. If he can't get them someone to sin a lot, he'll get them to sin a little. If he can't get them to sin a little, he'll get them to waste a bunch of time. And so on and so forth until he just wants to prevent you from the next level of good. That's shaitan's goal. So this is, um, then Musa Islam says, I find in the tablets a nation of people who shall be resurrected and assembled on the day of judgment with their faces like full moons. And we live in you know urban society where light, you know, there's, earth, there's light pollution, but Otherwise, if you go to an area where there's no light at all, and then you see a full moon, it brightens the entire night sky, and now you can see everything. So their faces, the faces of this nation will be like full moons, God replied. And so Musa al-Islam says what? Let them be my nation. Let them be my nation. Bani Israel, let them be mine. Allah says, they are the nation of Ahmad. I shall gather them on the day of judgment, when their foreheads and limbs shall be blazing white, from the effects of the wudu that they would make and the, the sajda that they would make. That this is the effect of all the wudu that someone does. It's going to give you light. On the Day of Judgment, it's going to be dark. But your faces, the faces of this ummah, they will be light for people. There will be disbelievers who will come up to, to the believers, inshallah, on the Day of Judgment, asking them for a portion of their light. For a portion of their light. Because none of the, there's not going to be like a, flashlight with the iPhone, like that's not, it's going to be light on your faces from sajda, from wudu, from prayer. He then says, O Lord, Ya Allah, I find in the tablets a nation whose people, um, whose clothes are on their backs, whose swords are on their shoulders, people of certitude and tawakkul, they glorify you from the top of minarets, from the top of the, the towers that folks make a ban from. They continue to fight for every righteous cause until they even battle against the Dajjal. And he says, let them be my nation. And Allah says, they are the nation of Ahmad. So he keeps going. He says, oh Allah, I find in the tablets a nation of people who pray five times a day and night, five hours of the day, for whom the gates of heaven are open and whom mercy descends. He says, let them be my nation. Allah says, they are the nation of Ahmad. He continues to list so many different virtues of the nation. This, it's a lengthy, uh, lengthy hadith. We'll, we'll go through a few more parts of it. He said, I find in the tablets a nation for whom the entire earth is a place of ibadah and is pure. Let them be my nation. And who for whom that the spoils of war are lawful. And he says, they are the nation of Ahmad. So again, Musa alayhi salam, he's a prophet. He continues to ask every virtue. What Allah to- talked about this nation, this ummah, in the tablets that were given to Musa the, the, the tablets were, which were one of the revelations given to Musa salam, this nation was mentioned in those tablets. He says, O oh Allah, I find in them a nation who fast the month of Ramadan, whom you forgive for everything they've done before, let them be my nation. He said they are the nation of Ahmad. Then he mentions that they do Hajj. And then he mentions that, um, uh, that the amount of forgiveness Allah will grant for them. And then he mentions continually, continually, continually. He says, O oh Lord, I find in the tablets with mem- a nation of people who will be in first place on the day of judgment. There's going to be like rows on the day of judgment. There's people who are going to be in last place, people who are going to be in first place, people who are going to have no place. We want to be in the first rows. This is the way we should always make that let us be in the first rows with the Prophet the first rows with the, with the Prophet and, the, and his companions. He says, let them, they are the last to be created, but they are the first place in the Day of Judgment. How does that work? He says, let them be nine in my nation. He says, no, they are the nation of Ahmad. All of this because we get to be in the nation of the Prophet And he says, I find in the tablets a nation of people. When they intend one good deed, a good deed is written for them. 
even if they don't perform it. And when they do the good deed, they get 10 to 700 times the worth of that good deed. And then the nation who, when they intend to sin, but they don't commit it, nothing happens. But if they do commit the sin, they just get one sin for the for it. This is why the intention of the believer is so important. Many of us feel very, very, have been feeling a state of un- hopelessness to a degree, maybe with regards to what's going on in, in Palestine. Because literally, even if you wanted to drop everything and go there and help, you couldn't. Couldn't do it. The, the, nobody would let somebody in. They blocked it off completely. But the intention of the believer is so important because there will be people who will show up on the Day of Judgment and they'll have all of these rewards. The rewards of saving lives, the rewards of protecting children, the rewards of feeding people, the rewards of clothing people. And they'll say, well, I, I don't want to do any of this. Allah says, no, but when that was going on, when that, that, that genocide was taking place in Palestine, you were there weeping and worried and concerned for the ummah and you were making intention after intention, Ya Allah, please, if only I could, I would. And that intention, Allah says, through that intention, I already gave you everything that it is that you could have had. And then if somebody gets the ability to do it, of course, then they would go and do it. But the intention, this is for this nation. This ummah gets these types of things that just, I thought, I wanted to do something, you get a reward for it. It's so easy to succeed in this life if we just if we just appreciate the religion that we've been given. If we just appreciate the religion that we've been given. Um, and, and, and so he continues and continues and continues. So then he says, finally, O oh Lord, I find in the tablets a nation of people who will be resurrected and brought on the Day of Judgment as three groups. One shall enter Jannah without any reckoning, meaning no questions asked. You won't even have to stand before God, this group. Another's jan- uh, reckoning will be easy, and another will be rigorously judged, rigorously questioned by Allah. He says, May- let them be my nation. He said, they are the nation of Ahmad. So then he says, Musa Islam says, Ya Allah, you have spread out all this goodness for Ahmad and his nation. Let me be a member of his ummah. This is what Musa Islam says to God. And God says, oh Moses, I chose you and preferred you over other people with my message and my speech. Take what I've given you and be grateful, be thankful for what I've given you. But this is the, one of the greatest prophets in the history of Allah's creation, Moses. Moses is a very, very, very serious, important prophet, one of the ulil azam, the foremost of the messengers. And he's asking Allah at the end of this to be from, to be from uh, this nation, to be from this ummah. Not just that he wants this ummah to be his ummah, but he says, no, no, fine. I'm a prophet, but I'd rather it just be from the ummah of the prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That's amazing. This is the honor that's been given to the nation of the prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And so the, uh, the, the question really for us is, do we understand the blessings that we're, so, that we're basking in? And do we understand the blessing of the message that we have? And then do we understand the, the uh, I forgot what I was going to say, sorry. Um, do we understand the blessing of the message that we have? And then do we understand the blessing of being people who have a purpose in life, who have a focus in life? Um, and that in and of itself is huge. And we'll end with this, that the vast majority of people, as we mentioned, they don't, have, they don't know what their purpose is. They don't know why am I here, where am I going? And they certainly don't have the greatest of Allah's creation who's already tied to death. The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu he is the person who's been concerned for you since before you were born and when you die and on the Day of Judgment. Throughout all of these lives, the concern of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu extends and is a means of assisting you and I in our life. And so we have to keep that, um, uh, keep that in mind. And we have to remember and unlock this, the, the knowledge of the stages of our life and then remember the purpose that we have and use that as a fuel to help us going on the days when we're down because the life of the human being will be up and down, up and down. But as long as on the days when we're down, we get back up and we remember the focus and remember the purpose, we'll be in a good spot because we already have the blessing of being from the nation of Ahmad and وسلم, and that's going to be a means of immense madad and extra assistance for us. So with that, inshallah, we'll, we'll end if there's any questions. Um, if we do questions, and then we'll, like, we'll, with this class, as we mentioned, 
the next two topics will be about the life of the dunya, um, and then we'll basically be breaking out the rest of the chapters into two classes each until we end right before Ramadan, inshallah, if Allah gives us life, um, and, 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 um, and then use that as a time to prepare for, uh, for Ramadan. So Ramadan's about two months away, inshallah. So we'll try to keep it short. I would highly recommend if folks want this book, it's called The Lives of Man by Imam al-Haddad. It's like $12 on Amazon. Highly recommend getting it. We will be going through again each chapter. Um, it's very, 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 very good to read. Um, and it's very succinct but, but, and gets to the point on what's important to take away. So with that, are there any uh, questions, either in person or online uh, questions? Yeah. Yes. Great, great question. The question is, um, anybody who came from um, before the Prophet Wasallam's time, would they not have a chance to be in that first row? Uh, no, they will still have a chance. So as long as someone followed their Prophet, and they followed their Prophet with, um, with certainty and with resolve, the Prophets themselves are going to be in the first row. Right? And so then the people who are with them, their closest of followers, will also be in the first row with them. Um, but the numbers of this nation will vast outstrip all of the other numbers. Most of the other prophets, they didn't have many other followers at the, in terms of the level of, of, of uh, followers and the number of followers the prophet has. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. 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 So people who are, uh, speak the last part a little louder, the people who are really devout in their own religion, if they're Jewish or Christian. Yeah, yeah good question. If somebody um, is really devout in their practice, and so do they still have a chance to be part of that um, first row, even if they're non-Muslim? And they, they have their remembrance of God. Um, it's yeah. So ultimately, we, we always say with the Allah alam, like Allah is the judge of who goes to heaven and who goes to hell. And we don't have um, we have knowledge of what Allah told us in the Quran, but beyond that, Allah can decide to do and can operate outside of what He has uh, what He did with the rule. So there's like the rule and there's the exception to the rule. The rule is that once this religion has come down, every other religion effectively has now been abrogated. That is the rule. Um, but if somebody practiced, for example, at the time of the Prophet Sassam, they were Unitarian, um, just monotheists, they're Hanif. Before, they, before the Prophet Sassam came down with this message, they were already monotheists. They will, inshallah, get the reward of being from the Hanif of Ibrahim al Islam, from the monotheism of Ibrahim al Islam. The Christians, the Christians aren't really monotheists, right? The Christians worship Jesus as the Son of God, and their aqidah is extremely problematic. So. Um, while the sincerity of something could be uh, valued and appreciated, and ultimately, again, Allah can decide what, what he's going to do with that, um, we don't have that belief that they have the access to these stations if the, this religion has already come down. Um, and then with, the, with, with Bani Israel, with the Jews, um, Judaism does ha is, a, is a strongly monotheistic religion, and so there are people among the Jews, Allah says in the Quran, that there are some, from, from some of them, there are believers, but the vast majority are not. And so uh, it would depend a lot on if somebody was presented Islam properly and then they rejected it. But just because somebody exists and they never heard of Islam, are they going to be accountable for it or not? The scholars have vast differing opinions on what that accountability would be. Imam Ghazali says they would have to have been presented it in its proper form for them to have been given a chance. Now that's our job. And our weakness, right, if we're living in a country full of non-Muslims and we're never presenting Islam to them, and we're letting um, everybody just kind of do their own thing, it's on, it's on us to present and to propagate the religion of the Prophet ﷺ. But once he comes down, came down, we don't believe in um, uh, this idea that you can be from any monotheistic religion. You have to follow this religion. But before he came down, ﷺ, um, then yeah, any of the monotheistic religions would have, would have, uh, you know, would have worked. But we want the last thing is we 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 don't use our time too much on where is this person going to go, where is this person not going to go, 
Like that's a lot of Muslims spend time on that. That's really not a good way use of time. Um, where are the Shia going to go? Where are the Sunni going to go? Where are the Wahhabis going to go? Where are this going to go? Where are the Christians? Gonna go? Let God decide that. Focus on yourself and and purify ourselves, and then focus on spreading truth to people, and let Allah take care of the ultimate reckoning. Yeah. Sister side, any questions? Uh, online, the title of the book is "Lives of Man" by Imam Al Khattab. Lives of Man by Imam Al Khattab. And then there's a question on the Day of Judgment for people who didn't learn Islam. Hopefully, we covered that um, in the last uh, the last answer. Yeah. Um, so the question is, uh, with regards to the questions that are asked in the in the pre-eternal realm, what were those questions? Um, and 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 yeah, essentially, what were those questions? So the only questions in which there's confirmation on, which are in the Quran, uh, is the question of Allah Rabbikum, am I not your Lord? So that confirmation from Allah of uh, of asking with gathering the human beings on this plane and asking, am I not your Lord? And then bearing witness to that. Um, the other, uh, I actually have never, and I can you know follow up with you maybe afterwards. Um, haven't heard any narrations that would describe any other questions that the human being is given any choice in the matter. The qadr, the human being is not given choice in the qadr. You have a few prophets who would ask, for example, in one narration, the prophet Adam al Islam saw one of his children and he really liked his this this child. It was Dawood, the prophet David al Islam, and he said, "Give him some portion of my life." But Allah just said, I already decided everybody's lifespan. That's not really up to you. So the human being is actually not given any choice. Our belief is that the qadr and the, the decree is from Allah. On the day of judgment, afterwards, the human being is asked, um, for example, if they had a lot of suffering and a lot of tribulation, um, the human being is dipped into Jannah for just a second, and then they ask, are asked, did you have any suffering in this life? And they'll say, I had nothing. I don't remember a single amount of suffering. So that does happen afterwards. But as to the agreed upon questions from the from the creed at least of Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah, um, would be this this questioning that's mentioned in Surah Al Araf in the Quran of Allah asking us about His Lordship, and that would be the limit of the extent. Anything else that took in place, perhaps there's other um, narrations, but they wouldn't be considered mutawatir. Um, so we couldn't we wouldn't rely on them as kind of dominant um, narrations about the questions. Yeah. Yeah, good question. The question is, what are ways to get back to the fitra and that and and kind of back to the original that original state of heart if we feel like we've disconnected? Yeah. So ultimately, the entire journey of the deen is to get is to get back to the fitra. That's that's the purpose. The the summary, the essence of it is captured in, in what's known as the science of ihsan or the science of the soul. Um, so the science of Sufism, the science of spiritual excellence, the science of tazkiyat and nafs, whatever word someone uses um, to describe it, helps someone purify their heart. And there's a there's a three-step process. The first is one empties all the bad traits from their heart. So this could be traits like arrogance, a, um, getting over angry, um, uh, uh, being full of themselves, um, so, and so on and so forth, being cheap, right? all the different traits that someone has that are bad. They're mentioned in the books. The Prophet Sallallahu has laid them out. Um, and, and one empties them from the heart. Uh, uh, having a, a sharp tongue, yelling at people a lot, verbally abusing people, and so on and so forth. One empties these traits. Similarly, one empties this, uh, egg, uh, removes the sins that they're doing. So you would come up with like a, of I have these sins that I'm doing. These are the big ones. These are the ones I have that are, that are less um, significant. One keeps working on them until they've cleansed them. That's the first step. The second now is what's known as inculcating goodness inside of somebody. So the more Nurani actions, luminous actions someone does, the more that that um, the heart starts to become polished and purified. The heart is like a mirror. Once it's fully, 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 fully polished, it now reflects the light of God. And when it reflects the light of God, all these realities become clear in the heart. So now somebody starts to clean themselves and, and add good deeds. So this would be um, uh, behaving in a righteous manner, having good akhlaq, obviously all of our five uh, pillars of our religion behaving well with one's parents, respecting our elders, and so on. Um, uh, so th that would be the second. Um, the third then is now somebody starting to take all of the extra time that they have, and this is where now someone who's really focused on Ihsan would become um, focused, uh, or would have to apply. So the Prophet ﷺ said that Ihsan is to worship Allah as though we see him, and even though we don't see him, know that he sees us. So one acts in a daily basis with this understanding that Allah is watching me. 
Allah is aware of what I'm doing. And I have to be conscious in my efforts and in my interactions with people and with the divine, knowing that there is this perpetual um, uh, uh, muhasaba that I take myself to account to. So this kind of vigilance that one has to have. If somebody can accomplish that, now their whole day becomes light and upon light. And now their, their heart actually gets surrounded in the inner realm with angels. And those angels assist them in doing more good deeds. And now they become, they go back to the, the fitra. Um, so, but that's really, it's a journey. And so, uh, but, but to study the books of Imam Haddad, Imam Ghazali, uh, they've laid out what this journey is. And so if we can implement them, then inshallah, that, that will be a way of, of, of getting there, inshallah. Okay, so with that, anything else? Anything online? Where do these classes take place in person? Uh, we are in Oakland, California at Lighthouse Masjid, um, 7 p.m. Pacific time. We'll be doing this weekly, inshallah. Okay, I think that's it. So I know the du'a. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على سيدنا محمد في الأولين وصل وسلم وبارك على سيدنا محمد في الآخرين وصل وسلم وبارك على سيدنا محمد في الملا إلى يوم الدين ربنا أتنا في الدنيا حسنة وما في الآخرة حسنة وما كنا ذاب النار ربنا تقبل منا إنك أنت السميع العليم وتوب لنا إنك أنت التواب الرحيم لا إله إلا أنت سبحانك إني كنت من الظالمين يا الله يا رحمن يا رحيم يا فتاح يا مبين يا الله يا الله we ask يا الله that you Accept, Ya Allah, from us and that you pardon us and that you forgive us and that you make us people of purpose and people of high himma and that you put barakah and tawfiq in our ability to learn, Ya Rabbil Alameen, and in our intentions that we have, Ya Allah. Ya Allah, we ask, Ya Allah, that while we are sitting and we, we, are, we are in a state of peace and we are in a state of enjoyment of our blessings, Ya Allah, we, we continue to feel for our brothers and sisters in Gaza and in the West Bank and in Palestine and all throughout many other parts of the Muslim world and their suffering, Ya Allah, we ask, Ya Rahman, that you pour your Rahmah upon Gaza, Ya Allah, we ask, Ya Hafid, that you pour your special protection, Ya Latif, that you pour your special Lutf upon them, Ya Allah, Ya Allah, Ya Aziz, Ya Aziz, Ya Qawil, Ya Mateen, we ask that you assist them, Ya Allah, we ask that you protect them, that you protect the children and that you protect the infants and you protect the toddlers and you protect all of them, Ya Allah, from this evil aggression, Ya Allah, we ask that you give Himma to them, Ya Allah, we ask that you give himma to the parents and that you give them all supper and that you give them all tawakkul and that you help the elderly and you help the, the men and the women and the children and everybody in Gaza, Ya Allah, and in the West Bank who is struggling under this and who is, who is suffering, Ya Allah, who is suffering immensely. We, ya Razak, we ask that you provide for them, that you give them food, that you give them water, that you give them shelter, that you give them ease, that you give them warmth. Ya Allah, Ya Allah, we ask, Ya Allah, that you assist them, that you give them strength, that you plant their feet firmly. Rabbana afriq alayna sabran wa tabit aqdamana wa nsurna lilqawm al-kafirin. Ya Allah, we ask that those who are resisting, Ya Allah, we ask that you give them tawfiq and that you give them the ability to resist against these occupiers and that you defeat your enemies, Ya Allah, and the enemies of creation, Ya Allah, and these Zionist enemies that you remove these devils from the planet, Ya Allah, and that you take them to account with the most intense of your reckoning. Ya Aziz, Ya Aziz, Ya Aziz, Ya Qawil, Ya Mateen, Ya Allah, throw these that these oppressors and these tyrants, Ya Allah, into the pits of your fire, Ya Allah, and give the Palestinians and those who are suffering the highest of stations of Jannah with the Prophet Sallallahu and that you give them, Ya Allah, we ask that you accept their shahada and that you accept those who have passed away and that those who who are suffering and those who are sick and those who need healing, we ask that you heal them, Ya Shafi, Ya Allah. Ya Allah, we ask that you give us purpose in our life and that you not allow us to wander aimlessly and that you allow us to be focused people, Ya Allah, as we are getting very close to the end days, Ya Allah, and we are in these end days, Ya Allah, and we are in the end of times, Ya Allah. We ask that you make us people who work for the Ummah of the Prophet Sallallahu and who serve this Ummah in the best of ways, Ya Rabbil Alameen, and who serve you in the best of ways, and who understand what our purpose is, and who understand what our purpose is in this world, and who are beacons of light and beacons of guidance for people, Ya Rabbil Alameen, Ya Allah, we ask that you transform us inwardly and outwardly, and that you transform our families, and that you transform our hearts, and that you transform our society, Ya Rabbil Alameen, to be people of Yaqeen, and people of Tawheed, and people of of, of from the highest stations of Tawheed, Ya Rabbil Alameen, we ask that you pardon us and that you forgive us and that you grant us the ability to be forgiven, Ya Allah, for the sake of gathering for you and for the sake of trying to learn for you. And we ask that you forgive anything it is that we intend or that we said that was inappropriate or that was wrong, Ya Rabbil Alameen, that you put barakah and tawfiq in everything it is and every intention that we have. We ask you for everything good the Prophet asked for and we ask you protection from everything evil that he has protection from. And we ask that you give us a husn al-khatima 
the best of seals in this life and in the next life and that you protect us and our children and our parents and our loved ones, Ya Allah, and our, and our family, Ya Allah, and all of those to come of, and make them people of La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah wa sallallahu wa sallam wa ala Sayyidina Muhammad and Nabi al-Ummi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen alhamdulillah we, there's a few more questions that came in so inshallah we'll get to those next week um, inshallah